never, no, never, never, never say you'll never fall in love. They tried to lead normal lives. They fell in love. Violet became engaged to Maurice Lambert. They were denied a marriage license in 21 states because they were told it would be contrary to morals and public policy. I am Violet Hilton. This is my prospective bridegroom, Maurice Lambert. We tried very hard to procure a marriage license, both in the states of New York and New Jersey, but were refused in both places. I feel very unhappy about it because I love Maurice very, very dearly and he loves me. And I don't see any reason in the world why we should be denied the pleasure of being happy. My sister Daisy feels the same way about it, and she too wants me to be happy. Their dreams of a happy marriage were never fulfilled. At the height of their career, they starred in a movie called Chained for Life. This scene closely paralleled the frustration and tragedy of their own lives. I can't, I can't go on. Don't you think I know how you feel? I wanted love, too. All our lives, we've had to bury every normal emotion. I'm not a machine. I'm a woman. I should have the right to live like one. We've always said we were like other people, yet different. Ironically, the film that was the highlight of their career marked the end of their fame as show business attractions. The harsh reality of the film proved too much for the audience to bear. The audience could no longer enjoy their talents and not be aware of the twins' suffering. Free? But we've always been together. And we'll be that way forever. Toward the end of their lives, they left show business, ran a hotel for a while, and then wound up as checkers in a supermarket in Charlotte, North Carolina. They died in 1969 of complications of the Hong Kong flu. It was ironic that they ended their lives in North Carolina, the same state that welcomed their famous counterparts, Chang and Eng. Chang and Eng were different from other people from the moment they were born. Others, like Tom Thumb and Robert Wadlow, were perfectly normal at birth. That was also certainly true of Robert Earl Hughes who, according to medical record, was the heaviest man who ever lived. Robert was a big baby when he was born in 1926 in Illinois. Eleven and a half pounds, but babies that size are not so uncommon. A seizure of whooping cough disturbed his endocrine balance. He began to gain weight, and there was nothing anyone could do to stop it. By the age of 18, he weighed 693 pounds. At 25, 896, and he was getting heavier. What can someone that heavy do for a living? As a youngster, the huge boy worked on a farm, but he quickly became too heavy and slow. Still, he wanted to earn his own way, to live like other people. Only the sideshow would have him, and they paid him well. To travel to fairs and carnivals, he needed his own special van built on a trailer truck with specially built chairs, a special bed. Ordinary ones wouldn't hold him. At 32, he weighed 1,069 pounds. He measured 122 inches around the waist, 124 inches around the chest, and 40 inches around the upper arm. Almost any activity made his heart pound. Any illness would have serious complications. In the end, it was just a run-of-the-mill disease that killed him. In 1958, he died of complications caused by catching measles. Thousands of people came to bid him farewell. The Quincy Herald Whig reported, Thus ended the funeral of a big man. Big in size, and big in heart. Everyone who knew Robert Earl Hughes remarked that despite his personal tragedy, he never failed to be concerned for other people. He was always remarkably cheerful. That ability to defy the odds and be happy is typical of these special people. It was certainly true of Pete Robinson. He was also big in heart. 
But uh, no one could ever call Pete big in size. Pete Robinson was known as the living skeleton. No matter how much food Pete ate, he never could put on weight. So he took advantage of his unique appearance and became an accomplished, eccentric dancer. He weighed just 58 pounds, a wisp of a man. His sweetheart, Bonnie Smith, at 467 pounds, was eight times his weight. Their act caught the imagination of the public. Everyone came to see the world's thinnest man court the country's fattest lady. Ironically, their act became a reality when Pete fell in love. so light a strong wind could blow him over. No doctor could help him, but Pete thought Bunny's love would. At first she resisted. For eight years he courted her, at sideshows, where they worked together in Coney Island, at carnivals, or on the road with a circus. Finally, on the ninth year, 1924, 468 pound Bunny said yes to 58 pound Pete. The circus celebrated their wedding with gala rites at Madison Square Garden. It was also a celebration of love and courage. Pete and Bunny went waltzing happily through life together, just like other people, if they're lucky. Even a man who is pure of heart and says his prayers by night they become a wolf when the wolfbane blooms and the autumn moon is bright. So goes the ancient proverb that through magic or witchcraft, men can turn themselves into beasts. A few moments ago, Pietro was a man, a harmless, good-natured man. Look at him now. He's no longer human. He's a wolf, snarling, ferocious, lusting for the kill. You're looking at a scientific miracle, gentlemen. Religion exists in every country, in every culture. During the centuries of witch persecution, this phenomenon was seen as simply another activity of the devil, transforming himself into a wolf ranging the countryside at night and terrorizing the people. The bite of the werewolf turned the bitten one into another demon, doomed to eternal life of murder at the full moon. It was thought the only way a werewolf could be killed was by a silver bullet. Do these legends come from out of the dark, buried fears of our subconscious? Do we fear that our link to animals is more fragile than we think? The literal werewolf does not exist. It is only a myth, only a creature of the mind. Or is he? It is claimed these myths were inspired by actual human beings, like these, documented by 16th century Austrian paintings. And later in the 19th century, by Mung Fosset of Ceylon and the Vauxhall family of Burma. In the beginning, I said there was a quality of legend about these people, like characters in fairy tales. This was especially true of Lionel, the lion man, who looked as if he'd stepped out of the tale of Beauty and the Beast. Lionel's real name was Stefan Bebrowski. He was born in Poland in 1890. Every inch of his body was covered with thick hair. Lionel looked so frightening that when he went out in the street, he had to hide behind a veil. In the early 1900s, he became a consummate circus performer. He was soon making $500 a week. That was a lot of money when we consider $9 could buy a man's suit in those days. His act combined facts.